Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. Let's get down to business. If you haven't noticed, June is LGBTQ Pride Month. According to Wikipedia, the full title that doesn't exclude any letter and hence offend any group is LGBTQQIAAP. Uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, ally, and pansexual. Of course, there's no full agreement concerning which initials are correct and accepted. Uh, various groups are still fighting each other over this. But June is the month designated to celebrate all of this sexual deviance. However, you may have noticed that October is also associated with LGBTQ month, specifically History Month. October 11th is considered Come Out of the Closet Day. Uh, Gay History Month was created by homosexual activists way back in 1994. Uh, they coordinated marches and protests for October. Uh, they soon got a number of key politicians, governors, mayors, to officially recognize the month. And one year later, in 1995, the NEA, the National Education Association, recognized and supported October as LGBTQ History Month, which tells us where the leadership of the NEA is ideologically. Uh, but homosexual activists wanted to have a second month. Not for history, but to celebrate. And so they lobbied President Clinton in 2000 to declare June Gay and Lesbian Pride Month. Not just a day, but an entire month. Uh, June was chosen to remember the Stonewall Riots back in June of 1969, where the police were arresting homosexuals at the Stonewall Inn in Lower Manhattan. In 2009, President Obama expanded the title, making June Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Pride Month. So now this movement has convinced our culture to celebrate their lifestyle two months out of the year. Some news in this regard. Last week, the mayor of New York City, de Blasio, commissioned a monument to be built for transgenders. From Forbes, uh, New York City is erecting a monument to two transgender women whose names are forever linked to the movement that celebrates 50 years of LGBTQ activism. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced on Thursday that the proposed monument is to be placed into a neighborhood in Greenwich Village. It's just steps away from the Stonewall Inn where a police raid turned into a riot by gays, lesbians, and trans people. It's part of the city's effort to fix a glaring gender gap in public art. Statues of LGBTQ individuals are virtually non-existent among the city's monuments. And the city says the dedication to Johnson and Rivera will be one of the first for transgender people. Uh, you may want to check out a God and Country program I did a while back. Uh, program number 245, where I explain how President Obama designated the Stonewall Inn as a national monument uh, to recognize the struggle for homosexual acceptance. What we're seeing here, uh, more and more every year, is the mainstreaming of the LGBTQ movement. Government buildings are being lit up in rainbow colors to show their support for the homosexual transgender lifestyle, the House of Parliament, uh, state capitol buildings, California, Wisconsin, Illinois, of course, the New York City Library, and the Empire State Building. Under Barack Obama, the White House was lit up in rainbow colors, but not under Donald Trump. Trump had the, had the White House lit up in blue uh, to remember... Uh, police officers who died in the line of duty. Uh, under President Obama, U.S. embassies were encouraged to fly rainbow flags. 
Uh, this year, President Trump denied those requests. But uh, President Trump still tweeted out, as we celebrate Pride Month and recognize the outstanding contributions of LGBT people have made to our great nation, let us stand in solidarity with many LGBT people. Also, the Democrats, the ones running for president, showed up in Des Moines, Iowa at their Pride Festival Oh, the candidates all promised to further the homosexual agenda. Buttigieg was the featured speaker. Uh, Senator Kristen Gillibrand promised to codify marriage equality. Uh, she promised to ban anyone who tries to counsel anyone out of being LGBT. Uh, she promised to hire Justice Department lawyers to go after anyone who discriminates against LGBT. Uh, she wants to have the federal government recognize a third gender on government documents uh, to require schools to permit students to use the bathrooms of their choice and to create government programs to pay for lesbians to have in vitro fertilization. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, she was dancing in the Pride Parade throughout the streets of Boston she tweeted, Pride Month is a celebration, and it's a time to remember the trailblazers who fought for LGBT rights. We renew our commitment until everyone can live proudly without fear. And I'll be right alongside of you. Happy hashtag Pride. So politicians are tripping over themselves to show themselves to be the most supportive of the LGBTQ agenda. Again, the movement is going mainstream. I have heard from a number of sources uh, that now the majority of those attending the pride parades are not homosexuals, but straight people. They may not practice homosexuality, but they agree with the ideology that there is no moral law of God that needs to be followed, that everyone should be able to do his or her own thing sexually. And people have been telling me that this month, uh, television is full of LGBTQ advertisements and documentaries. All sorts of major corporations are announcing their support for the movement. Even churches are flying rainbow flags. And a new thing I've seen this year, if a business or an institution is not flying the rainbow flag, Activists call them out and ask why. The movement is using Pride Month to target and to pressure non-supporters. But isn't it ironic that the sexually deviant in our country are marching in every city under the banner of pride? 1 Timothy chapter 3, pride was the condemnation of the devil. And Israel, in the days of her moral and religious apostasy, the Old Testament spoke against the pride of the people. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 9, Thus saith the Lord, Just so will I destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem, this wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts. And Isaiah chapter 9, verse 8, The Lord sends a message against Jacob and falls on Israel, and all the people know it. That is, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria asserting pride and an arrogance of heart. What was the sin of Sodom? Any good student of the Bible will tell you it was homosexuality. Uh, Genesis chapter 18, verse 20. And the Lord said, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great and their sin is exceedingly grave. And then in the next chapter, Genesis 19, uh, the sin of Sodom is described as homosexuality. In the New Testament, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, it states that Sodom and Gomorrah were condemned to ashes because of the people's ungodly sensual conduct. The Greek word being translated sensual means sexual debauchery. And in Jude chapter 7, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them 
indulged in gross immoralities and went after strange, unnatural flesh. But the prophet Ezekiel expands more on the sins of Sodom. In explaining that Israel has become just like Sodom, Ezekiel writes this in Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease. But she did not help the poor and the needy. Now, homosexual activists in religion at this point will say, aha, see, the sin of Sodom was not homosexuality. God is not against homosexuals. The sin was greed. The city did not help the poor and the needy. They weren't socialists. But read the next verse, verse 50. Thus, they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I removed them when I saw it. What does abominations refer to? Well, in the law of Moses, the word abomination is used almost exclusively in reference to sexual deviance. Leviticus 19 or 18. Uh, But the point Ezekiel is making is in regard to the sins of the spirit that led to these physical sins. Because they were arrogant and haughty, thus they committed abominations before me. Before culture falls into the sin of LGBTQ, they first take pride in themselves. The fear of the Lord is absent. Uh, The people begin to think what is right and wrong morally is to be determined by them, by their own sensual desires. They no longer believe that there is the law of nature and nature's God to which they must submit. In simpler terms, it takes a lot of chutzpah to turn to LGBTQ. You know, that's Yiddish for a lot of gall brazen boldness. You know, think about it. What does it take to throw off Christian values and standard historic social norms and dress up like a drag queen and flaunt your sexual desires in a public parade? It takes a lot of arrogance. So again, in Ezekiel 16, the people of Sodom were arrogant and haughty, so they therefore committed abominations. A bad heart brings forth bad actions. Bad trees bring forth bad fruit. And what are the Hebrew words behind these English words, arrogant and haughty? Ezekiel 16.49. The Hebrew word for arrogant, gaon, means to exalt oneself. It is translated arrogant three times in the Old Testament, It is translated pride 29 times. The second word, haughty, used in Ezekiel 16.50, is gabah. It's an intensified version, which means to highly exalt oneself, translated haughty four times in the Old Testament, and translated three times pride. The Old King James Version even translates Ezekiel 16.49, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride. So, now, in 2019, at the end of the church age, what are the Sodomites calling their parades? Pride parades. What a coincidence. But somebody might say, well, no, no, this is good pride. Like pride in country or pride in your work. But, On the contrary, this is a class of people who have come to believe that their feelings of pride in regard to their sexual deviance is actually a virtue. And this is the lowest state of sociopathic depravity, where one begins to believe that their vice is actually a virtue. Um, This is no mistake. It's no coincidence that the Sodomites now have pride parades. Now, I'd like to say a word about the Sodomite flag, the the rainbow flag, because this also has a biblical dimension. You know, most Christians are aware of the irony here. 
the rainbow was God's promise that he would never again destroy the world by a flood. Why was the first earth destroyed? Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. The evil in the pre-flood world is described in the New Testament book of Jude, where Jude describes and links together the common sins of a number of people groups. The idolatrous Jews who set up the golden image of Baal in the wilderness wanderings, uh, the fallen angels, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, Cain, Balaam, Korah, and the people in the days of Noah. And what Jude says about all of these groups is that they all rebelled against God by abandoning their proper abode, indulging in gross immoralities, and going after a natural flesh, sexual deviance. In Jude 14, Jude states that the prophet Enoch preached to these people in the days of Noah that these people were ungodly, that they said harsh things against God, they were grumblers, and they followed after their own lusts. So it's clear that one of the major sins leading to the destruction of the pre-flood world was sexual deviance. So after the flood, God gave Noah and his descendants a promise of mercy and grace. And he confirmed it with the sign of the rainbow. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 12, God said, This is the sign of the covenant, which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and never again shall the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So there are two possible explanations here. First, the rainbow in the sky was something new. It never took place before the flood because the atmosphere of the earth was slightly different. Or second, uh, there were rainbows in the sky before the flood, but God simply gave significance to the rainbow that it never had before. I tend to take the former interpretation because of Genesis 2, verse 5, that states that there was no rain, but a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. And this gets into theories about a vapor canopy surrounding the earth and underground oceans that collapsed when the Noatic flood took place. But be that as it may, the point is that the God-given purpose of the rainbow is to remind mankind of God's mercy and grace, God's second chance, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, the kindness of God is meant to lead people to salvation, so don't think lightly of it. But what do we have in the homosexual transgender movement, in their arrogancy and in their pride? The very symbol of God's grace and God's patience, they are parading in the face of God as a symbol of their rebellion. So they have turned the symbol of God's grace and patience into a license to sin. Now, wait a minute. Isn't that exactly what the scriptures say about those who are sexually deviant? Back to the book of Jude, which again is all about the rebellious sexual deviance in the last days. Jude begins his book by stating that there are ungodly persons who turned the grace of God into licentiousness. Jude 4. The English word licentiousness has as its root license, the giving of oneself permission to break God's law. The Greek word is alselgia, which means to 
have sexual deviance or sexual debauchery. Uh, don't imagine that I'm pressing the biblical application too far here. Th these New Testament texts clearly refer to the practices of the LGBTQ movement of the last days. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. It clearly prophesizes that in the last days, mockers will come following after their own lusts. Uh, for further study into this, you can check out a previous program I did, program 235, about how the New Testament book of Jude is all about the LGBTQ movement of our day. Uh, but back to the rainbow flag here. The claim by those who originally designed the rainbow flag is that they chose the rainbow to represent accepting diversity. That sexual preferences are just like different colors of the rainbow that need to be appreciated and uh, accepted. You know, in the original design, there was no mention that this was a take on the Genesis chapter 9 covenant. But just because the designer didn't make the connection doesn't mean that the spiritual connection was not there. And just because people in parades today waving the flag are not making the connection doesn't mean the connection is not there. People fulfill prophecy and they break the law of God all the time without realizing the spiritual implication of what they're doing or the spiritual implication of their words or their symbols. Regardless of what people know, it's a fact that these people are taking the exclusive symbol that was given to mankind to mean one thing and using it to further their lusts. Now for me, years ago when I saw the rainbow was a beautiful spiritual lesson, it reminded me of God's creative power, of his covenant, of his mercy. But now when I see the rainbow and when most people see the rainbow today, we cannot help but think of the homosexual transgender movement. It's an utter display of arrogancy and mockery uh, that they have perverted God's sign and woe to such a people. But here's another biblical lesson. The LGBTQ movement having a flag. And that is an event with biblical ramifications. The transgenders have also created their own flag. Uh, this is from Wikipedia. The transgender pride flag was created by American trans woman Monica Helms in 1999 and was first shown at a pride parade in Phoenix, Arizona in 2000. The flag represents a transgender community and consists of five horizontal stripes, two light blue, two pink, and one white in the center. Helms describes the meaning of the flag as follows. Uh, the stripes at the top and the bottom are light blue, the traditional colors for baby boys. The stripes next to them are pink, the traditional color for baby girls. The stripe in the middle is white for those who are transitioning or considering themselves having a neutral or an undefined gender. The Bible has a lot to say about flags and the meaning or the purpose of flags and banners. I started looking into this a while back after hearing a commentator point out what I just mentioned, that the transgenders have their own flag, uh, the point that this commentator made was that the left, or what the Bible would call the ungodly, organized together into identity opposition groups. The feminists, the communists, the homosexuals, the transgenders, they all create organizations and identity groups. They combine to find strength in human numbers and to protest together. What are they protesting? Well, Christian moral values and ultimately God himself who establishes those norms. Whether they know it or not, it is God who they are opposing. Psalm chapter 2, they set, set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. And they say, let us break their chains apart. These are not chains of evil oppression, but chains of the righteous restraints of God's law. So this combining or uniting together for an evil cause reaches a critical 
level of rebellion when it includes the creation of a flag. A flag represents an identity, a country, a cause. Uh, flags are used by countries for a number of reasons, not simply to fly something in the air. Uh, the encyclopedia explains that a country will spend many hours and a lot of money to create their flag design because a flag is a country's way of portraying itself to the rest of the world. Flags were developed in the ancient world as something soldiers could recognize in a time of war. Flags can be used to unite a country. People that have never met before can feel united together uh, knowing that they're part of the same country and they fly under the same flag. People can look upon their flag and find inspiration in times of trouble as when the bombs exploded over Fort McHenry, showing throughout the night that the American flag over the fort was still standing. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, the biblical concept of a banner or a flag includes all of these concepts. The Hebrew word is nes. Numbers chapter 2, verse 2. The sons of Israel shall camp each by his own standard or flag. With the banners or flags of their fathers, they shall camp around the tent of meeting at a distance. Psalm chapter 20, verse 5. We will sing for joy over your victory, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all of your petitions. Psalm chapter 60, verse 4, You have given a banner to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Exodus chapter 17, verse 15, Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. God's people are unified together in a body, in a country, in a kingdom. Uh, we communicate to the world our identity in Christ. We call ourselves Christians. We display the sign of the cross. But just as much as we have a banner, that we represent our identity, the ungodly have created their own banner. And my point is this, that the sexually deviant, the immoral in the world, have not simply sinned against God. They have made their sin their cause, their identity, their country by creating a banner for their rebellion. And that is a whole greater level of rebellion against God. When you make a flag, a banner, to identify, to rally, to celebrate your sin, you are declaring war on God. Again, Psalm chapter 20, verse 5, We will sing for joy over your victory, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The LGBTQ community is instead saying, we will sing for joy over our victory and in the name of homosexuality and transgenderism, we will set up our banner. So what can we do about all this? Well, there's not a whole lot we can do except live holy lives and be a witness for Christ. As I explained a while back, I believe it was YouTube number 66, God must be our defense and our vindication. Psalm 119, 126. It's time for the Lord to act, for they have broken your law. Revelation chapter 18, verse 20. God has pronounced judgment against her for you. But in this, as we wait upon the Lord for vindication and justice, be assured that judgment is coming upon these people very soon. And we need to exercise faith in this matter. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 6 states that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were reduced to ashes. And they serve as an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. As judgment fell upon Sodom, judgment will fall upon this generation. But remember the example of Sodom. In Genesis chapter 18, what would prevent the Lord from destroying Sodom at any given moment? 
Well, the whole discussion between Abraham and God was that Sodom would be spared for the sake of the few righteous people in the city. Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 through 26, Abraham speaks to God and says, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. And God responds, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous, then I will spare the whole place on their account. So, as in the example of Sodom, this is what we're seeing today, our country is being spared for the sake of God's people. But once the wicked start to persecute the righteous and start to silence their witness, then the wicked forfeit the protection granted to them for the sake of the righteous. Once the wicked prevent the righteous from doing what God has called them to do on earth, the Great Commission, then God removes the wicked. Because the only reason God is putting up with this world right now is for the sake of the evangelism of his elect. But if the wicked thwart the mission of God's people, their end is imminent. Uh, Notice Psalm 107, verse 33. He changes rivers into a wilderness and springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Now, in that text, Psalm 107, the immediate example in view was the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. God will turn the land of the Sodomites into a wasteland. Uh, Here's a story that I heard this week that illustrates for me the importance of not wavering on our belief that judgment is soon to come. I was speaking with the husband of a lady who attends my church, and he shared that back in the late 1990s, Right before the dot-com bubble broke, he was working for one of those tech companies. His job was in accounting, and he saw that the company wasn't making any money, but they were spending money hand over fist. Uh, The company was claiming that their fiber optic cable lines, which which they were putting in certain neighborhoods, would soon be bringing in lots of cash flow. So the stock kept going up, Uh, Co-workers were telling this fellow that he needed to take all of his savings and buy the stock and he would soon be a millionaire. But this man was skeptical because he knew the laws of economics. He saw the price-earning ratio and he said to himself, something is not right here. Either the rules of money have changed or these people are fools. But his co-workers insisted that the world has entered into a new paradigm of business. Price-earning ratios don't matter anymore. But still, he didn't believe it. But then Microsoft invested $2 billion in his company. And he thought to himself, well, maybe these people know something I don't know. And so he started to invest. Well, within two months, the company was bankrupt. Everyone was broke and out on the streets. He should have stuck with what he knew about the laws of economics. When I heard that testimony, you know, I thought that that is just a perfect picture of the world. We know the rules. What you sow, you will reap. He that sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. Galatians chapter 6. But the world is saying, no, this is a new paradigm. God is not against LGBTQ people. These are good people. You need to jump on the LGBTQ bandwagon. Otherwise, you're going to be left in the dustbin of history. But you have some moral reservations. But then you see people of the world, people that you may have even trusted, um, investing in the spirit of this age. Churches, media outlets, governments, all investing very heavily in the crusade for LGBTQ rights and gender fluidity. But fear not. The moral law of God has not changed. The movement will collapse very soon. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Vengeance is mine and retribution. 
In due time, their foot will slip, for the day of their calamity is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. For the Lord will vindicate his people. He will have compassion on his servants. What you sow, you will reap. And you know, it's not as if there's no signs on the horizon. Uh, Anonymous sign, sign last week was this announcement that in the first eight months of this year, the federal government borrowed $730 billion to keep the government running, borrowing 30, 40 cents on every dollar uh, that the government spends. That's unsustainable. A reckoning is coming soon, but that's a subject for another program. Keep the faith. Keep standing in the evil day and having done everything to stand. Keep warning this generation to flee from the wrath to come and to flee into the arms of Christ. So thank you for including God and country in your discipleship in the word. Uh, Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to lend your moral support to the channel. You know, if you're one of those persons like me who like to work off of email rather than Twitter and texts, Uh, Send me your email. I'll send you a weekly email synopsis, a one-paragraph synopsis of the upcoming uh, program and the links. It's a good way to keep up with the programs if you don't have time to watch every program. My email address is on the closing slide. May God continue to bless you as you continue to live by the Word of God. (laughs) 